So hi everyone, my name is Victor Santiago. I am the a student and recent alumni engagement person here for the University Advancement Division here at IIT. I'm the one who's been working with our presenter, Gary Norselli, to get this to happen today. Um, so thank all of you here in person and those who are joining us online um, for being here. I know I'm gonna be taking a lot of notes because I'm also in the process of either trying to buy or even sell. So, um, but before we get him up here and presenting, I'm just gonna go over a few of the housekeeping items um, that we have that we kind of go over everything. Uh, for everybody online, um, you can't see anybody. <laughs> you only see anybody here uh, presenting and the interpreters on the screen. Everyone else has disappeared, no one there. Uh, but if you have any questions um, during the event, there is a Q&A box um, that you have an option to put them in there. Um, I'll be looking at those and we'll handle those near the end of the presentation. That goes for everyone here. If you have any questions, write something down and then at the end of the presentation, we'll answer those. Um, I have shared some of those questions that were submitted during the registration with Gary um, and he's tried to incorporate as many of them into his presentation as possible. Um, but again, if we don't get to them, um, there'll be follow up. Um, Thank you to our interpreters who are online um, helping us make this event accessible to all of our IT Tigers. We really, really do appreciate it. But that's kind of the housekeeping. Now I get to introduce this fine gentleman. Um, so, oh, and if you have any questions, put it in the um, chat and then we'll try to handle that as well for those of you who are online. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce RIT alumnus, Gary Narcelli. He is a graduate from the class of 2009, College of Business Saunders Marketing, correct? Perfect. Um, Gary is a New York State real estate associate broker and designated realtor with Keller Williams Realty, who began his career real estate, real estate 12 years ago, uh, shortly after graduating from RIT. Oh, where that? We're up there. Uh, <laughs> Coupling his interest in real estate and his passion for helping others has allowed Gary to provide enthusiasm, professionalism, and expertise throughout the real estate process to provide high levels of service in meeting his clients' real estate goals and dreams. Gary now holds the title of CEO, fancy, um, and lead agent for the Norselli team, which has a career sales volume of over $51 million. I don't know what that lingo means, but I'm pretty sure that's a lot. <laughs> um, but for this and for a lot of reasons, I'm so happy to have worked with him and getting this workshop to happen and so excited to have him here tonight. Um, without further ado, Gary, floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you very much, Victor. Thank you everyone for attending in person, online. Um, it's always a pleasure to kind of come back to RIT and be able to share you know, what I do with everyone um, and, and hopefully be able to make some impacts in different people's lives here. Um, I am really excited to kind of share a little bit more about the home buying process. Um, before I, you know, kind of get too deep into anything, I always do like to just state, um, you know, I am licensed in the state of New York. Um, so anything, if you're looking to purchase a home outside of New York, just be aware processes um, sometimes vary a little bit from one state to the next. Um, you know, so if, if you're considering, if you're on the Zoom or local and looking to buy outside of the state of New York, um, I can, I'm always happy to connect you with someone that may be able to kind of tell you how the process might be a little bit different in that state. Um, and like Victor said, I'm going to try to answer as many of the questions that came in ahead of time throughout the presentation, um, and I'll try to incorporate them in as I can. Uh, but certainly any questions, throw them in the chat. Um, I'll try and get to everything by the end there. All right. So... Again, uh, Victor already kind of did a little introduction of myself. Um, you know, some other things uh, worth mentioning. Um, I'm a member of the Greater Rochester, the New York State, and the National Association of Realtors. Um, I do hold a number of different designations as well, um, you know, mainly to kind of further enhance our education, um, you know, around mastering certain skill sets that we can best help our clients with. Um, I'm also a member of what's called our Associate Leadership Council within Keller Williams. Um, uh, a few select agents are asked to join to kind of help drive the mission and vision of um, kind of the company. And so being able to be a part of that, um, talk to other top agents in our area, um, again, just kind of helps me be on top of the market um, and best helping our clients there. 
Um, and then on top of that, I also do a lot of training and mentoring uh, for new agents. Um, so anyone who's interested in getting into real estate, um, a lot of times I'll sit down with them before they even get licensed and kind of talk to them about their goals and dreams and see if real estate might be the right fit for them or not. Um, but at the end of the day, I ended up getting into real estate because it's something I'm very passionate about. Um, I realized shortly after graduating RIT that if I was going to do something for the next 30, 40 years, it needed to be something that I truly was passionate about and could see the impact that I make in people's lives. So um, I ended up testing it out part time for a year or so um, and then realized I absolutely loved it. Uh, and I love seeing the joy that it brought to my clients and really being able to help them navigate that. So just a little bit about me there. But the real reason you're here today is to learn about the home buying process. So today's topics, things that we're going to go through, um, the current real estate market, um, it's definitely very intense. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, and I kind of broke down the home buying process into eight steps, um, trying to give you kind of like the step-by-step -step play of what you're going to be doing throughout um, that journey there. Um, at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about grants and incentives. I know there's a few questions that came in around those. Um, and then certainly we'll talk about next steps as well uh, for anyone who's kind of ready to get the ball rolling with, you know, purchasing a home. So first and foremost, the real estate market. So everyone who's starting to think about buying a house right now probably hears the term seller's market. Um, and common features of a, features of a seller's market, um, you're going to see that the inventory of homes for sale, so the number of homes that are available for buyers is so much lower than the number of buyers that are out there. There's just way too much demand and not enough supply. And that's causing our home values to rise quite substantially um, or more substantially than we've ever experienced in our area because we do have a pretty conservative real estate market. Um, you'll frequently see multiple offers and bidding wars. Um, it's And kind of in relation with that, you'll hear the term delayed negotiations, meaning a seller is not reviewing any offers until buyers have had a chance to see the house. So it eliminates a buyer being able to get in there within the first hour of being listed for sale, make an offer and get a response right away. Now it's common that you'll see the homes are on, on the market for five, six days before a seller accepts an offer, but that's really because they're not allowed to review any offers until the end of that time frame. Um, fewer days on market. Um, so compared to years ago where it was common that a house would be on the market for 30, 60 days. Um, nowadays, it's, it's odd if it's on the market for longer than seven days. Um, and then again, home values on the rise. So with such a demand for, for homes and so few available, we're seeing that buyers are competing and offering well over the asking price still. Um, and there's caveats to the market and everything. You know, Most often right now, we're seeing the homes that are in great condition, priced right, um, and great location, still getting 20 plus offers. Um, I can speak from experience. We just had a buyer uh, make an offer on a property and there's 24 offers that came in. Um, unfortunately, they did not get it. <laughs> it was already at the top of their price point. Uh, but that's where, again, another conversation around financing, what price point you're looking at comes into play. So deciding to buy, um, this is really the first step. You know, at the end of the day, it's up to you to decide whether it's right for you to buy a house or not. You can sit down with as many real estate professionals as you want. Um, it's not up to them to determine. Um, it ultimately is up to you to say, you know what, I think I'm ready to buy a house. But here's some of the key things to kind of keep in mind and consider, you know, wealth building opportunities. So as you own a home, home values over time generally tend to rise, especially what, what we've seen over the past few years. And so you're going to build equity in that home, um, especially as you're paying down that mortgage. The value appreciates. Um, there's also certain tax benefits. Um, and, and I should preface too, as I'm going through everything, um, some of it might be a little bit more surface level because there's so much that goes into the process. Um, so I'm going to try and touch upon as much as possible. Um, but to kind of dig a little deeper into certain things, um, I, I'll kind of let everyone know. Um, I'm always happy if you want to shoot me an email, reach out to me afterwards to kind of dive really deep into a certain topic. Um, existing homes versus new construction. So this is something where when you're considering buying a house, you might say, you know what, I just I don't see anything that I like out there. I'm looking within a budget that might allow me to build a home. And so that's certainly a consideration. It's a little bit of a different process. And new construction itself is definitely one of those specific things that we could spend an hour talking about um, in and of itself. Investment property is also a very specific topic, but I know there's a couple of questions that came in um, around investment properties. Um, and some of the things I just wanted to kind of make note of and mention, um, especially as a first time home buyer, 
you know, it's worth considering, you know, do you maybe buy a multifamily home that has, you know, two or more units and living in one unit while you rent out the other? It's a great way to kind of help supplement your mortgage payment. Um, so, you know, you're basically having the tenants pay a good chunk of that monthly payment for you. Um, I've seen a lot of first-time home buyers do that. Um, I've also seen a lot of, you know, people who don't even own a home yet just say, hey, I just want to purchase an investment property and just start generating income for myself. Um, and that's a great way of kind of passively on the side um, as you get started, building that investment portfolio is one at a time buying these properties. Um, I've seen some of my investor clients will utilize the equity they have in one property to help meet goals for other purchasing other properties. So there's a lot of um, kind of opportunity there um, if you're looking from an investment standpoint. But again, I'm not going to dive too deep into that, but I will just make a couple quick notes. Um, if you're an owner occupant, um, there's a little bit more flexibility around the financing requirements compared to if you are just strictly buying it for investment to rent out all the units. Um, there's probably going to be a higher down payment associated with it, usually 20 to 25% down payment. Um, I always advise my investors to make sure that they're considering all the factors when looking at their budget for that particular property. Um, for soon to be landlords, uh, I saw someone had asked about that. Um, some tips and advice that I have are just making sure you have a solid um, tenant lease uh, agreement in place. Talk to a real estate attorney, make sure it's ironclad to protect yourself as a landlord. Um, a good lease is going to have everything in it from, you know, a, that, that will, that will relate to tenant defaults to let's say you want to sell the property, how that's going to impact the tenant. So um, having a good tenant agreement um, and lease in place, um, considering property management, whether you're going to self-manage or have a property manager, um, you know, oversee the property and tenants for you. Um, and then just be, understand that the, the rules and regulations for um, renting out properties very much depends on the municipality that you're located in. So the city of Rochester, um, you're, you're going to see a lot stricter than if you get to more rural areas and locations. But it's definitely up to you as an investor to make sure that you know the, the rules and regulations and laws around where you're looking. Um, I know I had another question, um, you know, when it comes to how is it worth buying a house if I'm only going to be there for a year or so? Um, does it need to be a longer term investment um, to, to purchase and live in a house. Right now, <laughs> the way the market's been the past few years, I've actually had a handful of clients that purchased a home um, and unexpectedly actually had to sell within 12 months. And based on the current market conditions, um, they've actually made out, you know, some of them actually made a profit off of, you know, just the, the home appreciation from the market itself. Now, I would not say, I would not recommend that if the market were more balanced. Um, I would usually say you need to be mindful of, as a buyer, you're going to have a whole set of closing costs when you purchase the home. And then as a seller, you're going to have seller closing costs when you go to sell. And if you're only going to be in the house for a, a period of 12 months or so, you really want to do an analysis cost-wise and see if it's going to be worthwhile for you compared to just paying rent for that year. Um, but certainly if you're going to be in the property for at least a couple of years, you know, rather than putting you know, your money in someone else's pocket, it's worth starting to build equity for yourself. Uh, but at the end of the day, I always remind people, it's your decision. You know, you tend to talk to a lot of people that are, have bought homes or, you know, parents, you know, relatives, you know, friends, and they'll certainly provide their insight. But at the end of the day, it is your decision. Okay. Next step is working with a real estate agent. So I like to kind of highlight some of the things that, you know, are important to remember when you're working with an agent. Um, at the end of the day, a buyer's agent that's representing you is representing your best interest in purchasing the home. Um, a good agent isn't going to push you to make an offer just so they get a commission check. Um, they should be sitting down with you, analyzing your needs and wants, um, and really helping understand what's driving the search for you. Um, at the end of the day, you know, they're going to help you find the right home for you, not just say, hey, make an offer on this home because it's a great home. Um, so some of the things a buyer's agent does for you, educates you about the current markets, um, analyzes your needs and wants, guides you to homes that match your criteria, coordinates the work of other needed professionals, negotiates on your behalf. Um, yes, that's still possible uh, in this market. Um, checks and double checks paperwork and deadlines for compliance and solves problems that may arise. Um, and you'd be surprised. Um, there's 3,000 agents just in our area alone. Um, and we're all independent contractors. And so technically we all can, can do business a little differently, uh, but you'll see the agents that are 
you know, on top of things and, and really representing you in your best interest are going to kind of help make the process a little smoother and easier for you. Hopefully it, it's, it's going to be a stressful process, unfortunately, uh, but hopefully they can eliminate a good chunk of that stress for you. Um, also, too, I like to mention the term realtor. Um, it is specific to um, a certain group of agents. Um, anyone, when they get licensed, they're considered a real estate agent. But you, in order to be a realtor, you have to join a National Association of Realtors. And we specifically follow a certain code of ethics when it comes to not just working with our clients, but other industry professionals. So it is really important to make sure that the individual you're working with um, is a designated realtor. And I would say, for the most part, most agents, when they get licensed in our area, they do join our local um, real estate board, which is governed by the, the Association of Realtors. So they generally are realtors, um, but nonetheless should be following the code of ethics. Um, and the realtor network is one of the largest of its kind. Um, so I, I like to mention that because having not been from Rochester originally, I came up to RIT, I know a lot of people all over the place. Um, so when they reach out to me, I'm always happy to connect them with a, a designated realtor, um, wherever they're looking. So that way they can truly feel like they've got someone representing them um, and their best interest, best interest there. But um, it's also nice to be able to help guide our clients to individuals that if they have very specific needs um, or are looking for a very specific type of property, there's a lot of different designations that you know agents can specialize in to help those types of individuals. So you know we're always happy to make those connections for people. All right, so one of the things we're probably gonna end up focusing on most uh, because this is a big first step um, in the home buying process is the financing piece. So first and foremost, I will disclose, I am not a um, mortgage lender or a loan officer. Um, and I always advise everyone, um, once you're ready to kind of start the process, sit down with one because they're gonna dive into the finances in depth with you, okay? We're gonna talk again about a surface level um, conversation about around everything so you understand what to ask going into it. Um, so hopefully, again, you can kind of feel knowledgeable and that, that you're not just going into a blind. But there's a number of different ways that a buyer can purchase a home, right? So the hierarchy, I, I like to explain, of how buyers can fund a purchase Typically, you'll hear the terms cash is king, meaning if someone who has cash sitting in a bank account um, and they come in to purchase a house, they can just give the seller, hey, here's my cash. Um, underneath that is what we refer to as cash guarantee. So this is a very unique product that we've seen come up over the past few years with the market. But this is what a cash guarantee is when a buyer is intending on obtaining a mortgage. However, they pre-approved so well, and they meet certain eligibility requirements with the lender that they can actually go into making their offer as a cash offer and still get financing on the back end. So this is actually giving a lot of buyers that are planning on getting a mortgage that meet these eligibility requirements a leg up on a lot of other buyers. So at the end of the day, again, an agent's job is hopefully to help you best position you, especially in this market. Um, so they should kind of be explaining all these different options to you. So there's cash, cash guarantee, and then you'll typically see conventional financing. For buyers who are getting financing, conventional is the most common type of financing that you'll see, um, followed by government-backed financing. So government-backed financing is going to be loan programs such as FHA, VA, USDA, ones that are kind of backed by the government there. And the reason that those kind of fall on the bottom of the hierarchy is when a seller in this market is reviewing offers, they're going to look for the offer that has a great price, but also the least amount of risk associated with it. And the, the biggest difference between the government-backed mortgages and conventional financing is the appraisal. So when you purchase a home, you know when you apply for the mortgage, the bank's going to do an appraisal on the home. The appraisal is looking for two things, to determine the value of the home for the bank's purposes, but then also to make sure that the condition of the property is satisfactory for all the mortgage guidelines. FHA, VA, those government-backed products have much stricter guidelines compared to conventional. So that's why a seller will typically like to see a conventional financing buyer over one that's government-backed. Um, that's not to say it's impossible to, you know, get, you know, get a home with you know, government-backed financing. It's just, you know, when you're in competitive situations, unfortunately, right now, we're seeing that the sellers are going with high price, cash, waiving inspections, offers that just present the least amount of risk in getting to the closing table. 
Um, you'll hear the terms pre-qualification and pre-approval. And a lot of agents actually use the terms interchangeably. However, it's important to note that they are indeed different. A pre-qualification is a very initial just conversation around your finances. The bank has not verified anything. They haven't collected tax returns, um, you know, done your credit check and all. So pre-qualification is just a very initial look into what you might qualify for. Whereas that pre-approval is a stronger, um, you know, start to the financing, which most sellers are going to look for. They're going to ask for a pre-approval letter. So the pre-approval is going to, you know, require a number of things. Like I said, tax returns, usually bank statements, W-2s, 1099s if applicable. Um, but your lender will kind of go through that list of required documents with you. Um, you should be pre-approved before you look at homes. Um, technically, it's not required. However, the way I've always looked at it is why would you look at a home that you weren't sure if you would pre-approve for, right? So, because it can really set an unrealistic, unrealistic expectation then too of, you know, what you might actually be able to get. If you're looking at a home listed for 300000 but based on the pre-approval, um, maybe, you know, you're only comfortable going up to like 200, 225. Well, that's going to be a big difference in the, the, the condition of the house you're getting. So we always encourage our clients to sit down with a loan officer or um, a bank to get the pre-approval before you start looking at homes, before you determine what you're comfortable spending. Um, that way you go into it feeling good about the numbers specifically, because there's very much an emotional component to the process, um, but you have to keep in mind the financial, like logical side of it as well. And then as far as the mortgage payment goes, because um, most people will consider that there's going to be a monthly payment that you're making each month. Um, in lieu of your rent, you're now going to be making a, a mortgage payment. So that consists of four pieces. Your principal, that you're, the balance that you're paying down on the loan, um, interest, annual taxes. So the taxes are kind of incorporated into your monthly payment for the property. And then your homeowner's insurance. Now, there is actually a fifth item. It's not required, um, which is why I don't put it on here, but that's going to be what's referred to as PMI, so private mortgage insurance. And that's typically applied to the monthly payment when you're putting less than 20% down on the mortgage. Once you hit 20%, you can request that the PMI be removed from your mortgage payments. Um, if you do not make that request, by the time you hit 22% equity um, in the home, they're obligated to remove that PMI, okay? But it's up to the buyer or the homeowner to say, hey, I've got 20% equity in the home now. I want to remove the PMI. Um, let me make sure I haven't, because I know there's some questions that came in um, around financing. Someone had asked, when will rates go down? So rates actually have, have gone down slightly. So, um, so I would take advantage of the rates right now. Um, they were upwards of like sevens. Um, they're now down to the low sixes. Um, a lot of the loan officers and banks and lenders that I've spoken with over the past month or so, you know, they've seen the rates kind of come down slightly, but not all of them kind of agree that they don't anticipate them going back down to unfortunately what they were, um, you know, even two years ago. So, you know, I know I refinanced in 2020 at 2.5%, and a lot of people took advantage of the low interest rates. Now they're kind of getting back to, you know, kind of like a normal level, I would say, um, or what I kind of expect the interest rates to be at. Um, we might see them kind of dip down in, into the hot mid to high fives a little bit, you know, over, over this year, but I would not expect them really to get below five again. Um, but it's, it's so impossible to say, cause there's so many things that could happen. Um, and a, a lot of the economy comes into play with that. Um, but I, I do know that certain lenders are also kind of rolling out programs to help to help buyers get locked into, if they lock into a certain higher rate and rates do come down, they're starting to get creative around offering kind of like refinancing options to help reduce some of the fees associated with that. So that way you can, you know, refinance down the road if rates really did, you know, drop significantly enough where it made sense for you. Um, but yes, I, unfortunately, I don't see rates dropping down back down to like the threes, fours, uh, I believe the historic national average is actually like 8%. So we're still below, well below that, um, which is a good thing. Um, someone had asked about adjustable rate mortgages. So an adjustable rate mortgage um, basically is when, you know, and the most common one that you'll hear is a 5-1 arm, 
meaning you lock into a lower interest rate for the first five years. And then every year after that, the, the interest rate is subject to change, um, you know, and, and you might see that it's going to be adjustable from there on out. Now, it makes sense if you know you're only going to be in the home for, you know, a couple years, but you don't know for sure what the rates are going to be, you know, in, you know, the next, you know, three, five, 10 years. So the rates could end up jumping up on you. But at the end of the day, it, it's a conversation that you would have with the loan officer to see if an adjustable rate mortgage makes sense with what your, your home ownership goal is. But it's an option. I, I rarely see anyone, you know, use an adjustable rate mortgage. Most people will want to lock into the rates um, at the time that they're getting the mortgage. Um, talked a little bit about PMI. And so let me jump onto the next slide here, because this is an important, important one. So a lot of people will ask me, what are the typical costs of purchasing a home? So there's two different things that I like to kind of break down. The first is your closing cost. So how much money you're going to need out of pocket to purchase a home. So there's four key pieces of that. First is your down payment. So this is typically a percentage of the purchase price. Um, I know one question had come in on how much of a down payment should you have? Ultimately, there's, there's no right or wrong answer. You know, it's going to depend on your personal financial situation. It's going to depend on the price point. Um, there's a lot of different loan options out there. So you can get a loan for as little as 0% down. Um, they're a little bit more specific program types. However, you know, you can purchase a home with very minimal out of pocket. So long story short, you know, how much down payment you put is going to really depend on your personal finances. Uh, but again, when you're getting pre-approved, the, the loan officer can give you different scenarios and they might say, hey, you know what, if you wanted to save up for another, you know, six to 12 months, this is, you know, what you could save up. And this is what your monthly payment or closing costs might look like with this certain down payment. So they can really dive into running different scenarios for you. But for closing costs, first component, your down payment. Second component is what we refer to as escrows. And I usually tell people, estimate about approximately a year's worth of the taxes and homeowners insurance on the property. And escrow gets a little confusing, uh, but in a nutshell, <laughs> you know, what you're, what's happening there is you're initially funding your escrow accounts with the bank, because again, portion of your monthly payment is going to taxes. So when you're making those monthly payments, that escrow account is building up and it's going to then when the tax bill comes out, it's going to pay the tax bill from that escrow account. You need to initially fund that escrow account because if you only made one monthly payment between when you closed and when the first tax bill came out, they're not going to have enough money in that escrow account to pay the tax bill. So they're going to take into account, you know, the closing dates, how much, you know, they're estimating for that first tax bill. And that's going to be a portion of that. You're also going to be reimbursing the seller for what they've already paid for the year which now you own the property, okay? So usually I'll tell people that second component, roughly a year's worth of taxes and insurance on the home. The third component is gonna be all the bank fees and costs associated with purchasing a home. And this is where it'll really vary from one bank to the next. Um, a lot of the banks that like we recommend, usually they're pretty close to one another as far as their fees go. However, um, if you're really shopping around for different mortgages and products, you might see a difference you know, in some of the closing costs and what the banks themselves are charging you to produce that mortgage for you. Um, and the last thing that you're going to see for your closing costs, because we are the lovely state of New York, we have an attorney that's going to be representing you in the contract. Um, the seller is going to have their own attorney. The bank is also going to have their own attorney because, you know, why not? Uh, but your attorney is going to be looking out for your best interest on the legal side of the process. And the, the charge for that usually is roughly around like five to six hundred dollars. Um, if it's like a really complex, you know, transaction where there's a lot of stuff in addition to what's normal, then it could be a little bit more, but usually that's the rough estimate. So if you add up all those things, which again, it's really gonna depend on you know, purchase price and your personal uh, finances, um, that'll be how much you need to actually come out of pocket for the closing itself. Now, the closing costs you'll typically pay when you go and sign all the final paperwork and get the keys for the home. Up front, you are gonna have some, addition, some costs. Some of them go towards those closing costs. So the first thing that you're going to pay up front as soon as you have an accepted offer is what's referred to as an earnest money deposit. That deposit is your good faith commitment to following through with all the contract terms. So it's basically you saying, hey, here's some money up front that will be applied towards your purchase and closing costs. So let's say the bank said, based on this purchase price and your down payment, your closing costs are going to be $15,000. 
and you did a $5,000 earnest money deposit up front, you'll only need to then bring 10,000 to the actual closing. So it's going to go towards all the closing costs. But let's say, you know, you do an inspection on the home and something comes up and we can't resolve it with the seller. You're entitled to get the deposit back because you're not canceling just for no reason. Now, if you just get cold feet a week before closing, the seller is certainly going to argue to keep you know, your deposit because there's no contract reason at that point that you'd be able to cancel um, and get your deposit back. But generally, we'll say the deposit roughly 2 to 3% of the purchase price. That's the national average. Um, I will say I've seen buyers in this market you know, trying to be as competitive as possible. We'll do larger deposits because it shows a little bit more skin in the game you know, to the seller. The seller says, okay, I see that you're willing to put a large commitment into buying this house and you're not going to want to risk losing this, this money. Um, the second upfront cost, um, if you have an opportunity to do a home inspection, usually the home inspections run anywhere between four to $500. Um, where an inspector will come in from roof to foundation, give you their overall impression of the home. There's no pass or fail. Um, it's simply a, here's a report outlining all of our findings and the buyer does with it what they want. Um, bank appraisal. So when you apply for a mortgage, um, the bank is going to charge that appraisal fee that I had mentioned before. Usually it's between four to $600. Depending on if the bank incorporated that into their closing cost estimate, it might go towards that. Um, otherwise it might be on top. Um, and then the last thing you'll pay up front is going to be your homeowner's insurance policy. Um, so especially if you're getting a mortgage, the bank is not going to let you close unless you have that policy in place because the bank needs to know that you know, the home is protected in the event of a you know, catastrophe. So some additional financing tips, um, you know, first and foremost, I think someone had asked about like, how do we determine like, you know, what we, what we should want to spend at the end of the day, it's very personal. You have to look at your own personal budget and say, okay, what can I afford for my housing expenses? You know, my, my debts, my loans, things like that. Um, and obviously you don't want to be house poor when you buy a house. So I, I really encourage, uh, you know, my clients, at least when, we have those initial conversations. I tell them, okay, for, you know, go get pre-approved. I tell them, you know, make sure that you understand like what you're comfortable spending because you might pre-approve up to some crazy amount, but that doesn't mean you want to spend that much. Um, and usually that's where having an idea of what your monthly budget is for housing, the loan officer can take that into account and really help guide you to the right price point. And that's what helps us as agents when we're starting to show you homes is understanding what you're comfortable with. Um, I do recommend, you know, if you have the opportunity to shop around um, a couple of different lenders, be mindful, they will run your credit. So you could see a little bit of an impact on that. However, the time to shop around, you know, for a mortgage is really before you actually find the house. Because once you find a house and get under contract, everything moves very quickly and you have to immediately apply for the loan. So the pre-approval is not binding. The pre-approval you can get and it might expire. You might never buy a house. They're usually good for 60 to 90 days. And, you know, as long as nothing changes, they're usually very easily able to reissue a new pre-approval letter. But you're not committing to that bank until you actually find a home and submit the mortgage application for that property. Okay. Um, and then also too, as you're shopping around, as you're you know keeping your monthly budget in mind, ask the lender when you're getting pre-approved for what's referred to as a fee worksheet. So that fee worksheet is going to outline all those closing costs. Um, and if you are shopping around and you've asked all the lenders for that, you can then really compare apples to apples. You know, always tell them, you know, similar purchase price and down payment, but you'll see then all the comparison of the bank fees. And, you know, you might see one is significantly more than another, which certainly I would kind of figure out why. Um, but you might say, okay, well, you know, this lender is going to charge me less than fees overall, which maybe for me is, you know, more important to save money out of pocket. So, you know, definitely do your homework um, when you're shopping around um, and ask for the fee worksheets as well. Some home buyer don'ts. So some things that you want to be very mindful of. Um, I never like to put an absolute on anything, um, but I always tell people just use caution when you're doing certain things. Um, run it by your agent, run it by your loan officer, because they'll let you know if it's going to impact um, you know, your pre-approval status. But you know, don't apply for new credit cards um, or lines of credit that can have a negative impact um, you know, on your score there. Don't make any large purchases um, like a car or new furnishings for the home. It is very exciting once you get under contract to say, oh my God, I can't wait to furnish the space. Um, I'm going to go out and buy all this you know, new furniture. It's on sale. Um, I, I've, I had a client once, he was in a band and um, he, he bought a guitar and he put it on a credit card. And it just so happened that that put him over the debt to income ratio. 
that he that he couldn't exceed, and he no longer pre-approved for the house that he was under contract to buy. So we have to get creative, um, but there's just so many little things that can have an impact um, on being able to purchase the house. Um, don't max out your existing credit limits. Um, don't quit or change jobs. Um, that's not to say you can't, you know, you know, actively pursue other opportunities, but just be mindful that you know if you take an opportunity, you're like, oh, you know what. I'm making less money, but hey, the quality of life is going to be better. Um, you know, and you're in the middle of purchasing a home, just run it by the loan officer. Make sure the numbers um, with your new job are going to work out. Um, they also might require that you be with the new employer for a certain period of time, or at least are able to show, um, you know, a, a letter uh, of intent that you're going to be joining that employer. So, um, just keep your your loan officer in the loop when it comes to those things. Um, and then don't make any large deposits or withdrawals from your bank accounts without being able to back up, you know, where the money is coming or going. So, because uh, the banks will ask for verification. All right. So I think that's, uh, I can't, so actually one, one other thing when it comes to the financing um, real quick, um, I know one, per, uh, someone had asked about um, a very specific type of mortgage, um, specifically for doctors and physicians. Um, like I said, there's a number of different mortgage products out there. Um, I very surface level mentioned like conventional mortgages, FHA, you know, government backed mortgages, uh, but there are some very unique programs. And that's why I always tell people, talk to your loan officer and see what's going to be the best fit for you because certain like you know programs for like doctors and physicians are intended to help you know individuals when doctors and physicians have spent all this money on school um, they come out of it with so much debt um, that the doctor and physician loan programs will often take into account that you know th the banks will recognize that there's a certain amount of debt that they can now exclude from the debt to income ratio. So it definitely makes an impact um, when taking advantage of those programs, especially it helps when someone's just out of school um, and they're just starting to look for a home. Um, so it definitely, it's a little bit more of a unique um, product, but there's a number of different unique products out there for all different types of buyers. So it's just a matter of making sure that you ask the questions of the loan officer say, what, what kind of unique programs and opportunities does your bank or um, brokerage offer that can help me as a home buyer? All right. So next, once you've been pre-approved and really understand what you're comfortable spending, the fun, the, the fun part starts. Um, so actually finding the home. So how do buyers find a house nowadays? So one of the most common um, is by an agent. Um, as agents, we have access to what's referred to as the MLS, which is the multiple listing service. This is the database that all just about 99.9% .9 of the realtors in our area use to list homes for sale. And so when we have someone that we start working with, we'll set them up, up on a search directly through our MLS. So that way you're getting the listing notifications as soon as they literally go into the MLS. Compared to third-party websites um, like Zillow and Realtor.com, they often syndicate from our MLS database. So our MLS is really where it all initiates. Um, and then it kind of syncs out to those other places. So you'll often get things quicker by being with an agent on the MLS search. Um, we don't so much, we don't very frequently right now see off market properties where, oh, hey, you know, this one's not in the MLS, you know, want to go take a look at it. Mainly because most sellers recognize it's not in their best interest. <laughs> a seller, if they put their house on the market right now, it generally is going to get multiple offers and it's going to sell probably more than what they would have expected. Um, so when a seller is going to do it off market, you know, they have to really understand that they might not get, you know, the most favorable offer. So we don't see it too often right now. I briefly discussed third-party websites like Zillow, Realtor.com, for sale by owners. Again, you know, more most for sale by owners, um, we, we've seen kind of trickle off over the past couple of years. You know, they're opting to work with an agent because they want to get the MLS exposure and get a greater number of buyers into the house to consider making an offer. Um, additional considerations, um, you know, when you're looking at homes, consider if it's going to be a short-term or a long-term home. You know, if it's a short-term home, you know, I'll often tell people, you know, be mindful of like the resale value and the features that the home has to offer. You want to make sure that it's a home that ideally is going to appeal to a, a large number of buyers down the road. Um, so your typical like three bedroom, has like one and a half bathrooms, has a garage. Those are all things that are going to be appealing to buyers. Uh, whereas if you get very specific and have something very unique, maybe it's a very quirky layout, or maybe it's only 
I rarely see a one bedroom home, but let's say it only has one bedroom. That's going to appeal to such a limited number of buyers in the future that it could impact your resale value. Um, and longer term homes, if you plan on being there for a longer term, you might say, you know what, I'm okay doing some updating because we can really make it our own. Um, you know, we're, we're okay maybe making some changes to the house. So there's different things that, you know, as you walk through, you'll see how the home functions for you um, and how you intend on using it over time. So some different things to consider. Um, I usually try to break down the four categories. So features being, you know, the size, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, you know, the basically these particular qualities of the house. And then amenities are the kind of like nice to have things. Uh, it's nice to have like a fireplace or a deck or a patio, AC. Um, neighborhood is really important. You really can't change the neighborhood. You know, you can always change. Um, you, know, you can add an AC unit. You can add a fence, um, but you can't change the location. So I often start, you know, with the location when it comes to my buyer's home search to make sure that we're looking. We're not going to put them in some, in a location that they're not going to like um, and you're going to end up moving in 12 months. And then lifestyle. Lifestyle is so important. Again, this kind of is going to relate to you know, how the home is going to function for you. Um, you know, we under, try to understand what motivates our clients to buy right now. Do they have children, pets? Um, do they prefer a more open layout, a more separated, um, finished basis? Like how, how are they going to use that space? Um, and let me just check here. It's one of the questions that had come in uh, was, what do I do when my wants, the things that I want in a home, are too large for my budget, right? So again, this is a case where, all right, you, you want a lot of things in the home. However, maybe the budget doesn't quite warrant it. And a lot of times when that's the case, you know, I try to break it down and look at the things that are most important to the individual. Like what are some of the things that you're willing to compromise on? And what are the things that you can't? Um, and ultimately, there's going to be things that are harder to change with a home than others. So again, your location, you're not going to be able to change. Um, the layout of the home isn't quite as easy to change. You know, you can money, money will solve a lot of problems, but you know, it takes a lot of money to really re readjust the whole layout. So there's certain things that you really want to look at and say, okay, you know what, these are non-negotiables. Whereas you know, updating some flooring, you know, can always be updated down the road. Um, updating a kitchen or, you know, maybe the furnace is old. Well, a furnace can be replaced. Um, again, it's a matter of understanding, okay, like, you know, what am I going to expect within a certain price point? And, you know, what am I going to get? Um, keep, and one of the biggest challenges right now is that there's two prices, you know, that we have to consider. There's the asking price for a home, what the property is listed for sale at, and then there's going to be the selling price. And, you know, over the past few years, it's very common. The selling price ends up being a lot more than what the asking price is. So a lot of our buyers end up looking well below their budget to make sure that they give themselves that flexibility and room to move up um, if they need to. So in making an offer now, um, so something, so some of the things that, you know, once you find a house that you're like, you know what, this is one that, you know, will work for us and you know, we really like. Next, we'll be making an offer on it. So the, your buyer's agent, a couple of things that they'll do right, right away is obtain any additional information on the home. So if you had follow-up questions after the showing or anything like that, they'll get as much information as they can. Um, I always expect that a buyer's agent is going to reach out directly to the listing agent that represents the seller. And they should be asking like, hey, is there any terms specifically that, the, that might appeal to the seller? It makes such a difference when the buyer's agent actually calls and reaches out to the listing. You'd be surprised that most agents don't do that. Um, and agents on the seller side, when we get those phone calls from a buyer's agent, we remember it um, because not everyone does. But you know, a lot of times the listing agent might say, hey, you know what? Uh, my seller is looking for a closing date of XYZ. Um, if they could rent back for a week while they move into their next house, that'd be great. Uh, oh, and hey, you know, I think they really like the freezer in the basement, so they might want to take that. Those are all things that as a buyer, you can kind of incorporate into your offer to make it as appealing as possible to the seller. Um, prepare a comparable market analysis, so a CMA. Um, this is basically a look at the recent comparable home sales over the past six to 12 months. Not super reliable <laughs> right now, just because home values are changing so quickly that if I look at home sales from the past 12 months, the market today is behaving differently than it did then. And a lot of times the, the recommendations that I provide to my clients is based on current market data. Um, we have a lot of buyers that we work with. And so when they're making offers, we're starting to get an idea and sense of not 
just, you know, okay, what, what did something sell for, but what's the market actually doing? Is the market still waiving inspections? Um, how, how many offers were there? So we know how many buyers are out there looking and making offers on one particular property. Um, like I referenced before, you know, we had one of our buyers, one of 24 just last week. Um, I heard another agent in my office um, just yesterday, they, their buyer made an offer on a property that had 50 something offers. Now that property was priced well below, you know, I think what it was ever going to sell for. So, but again, that's a pricing strategy that a seller took. Um, obtain required federal and state uh, property disclosures. So there's certain disclosures that are required by a seller to provide to you as the buyer. Um, and then fair housing and cover letters. So fair housing is so important in this market. Um, there is such, there's so much that could happen throughout the communication between agents, um, buyer, seller, that we never want anyone to ever experience any form of discrimination. There are a number of protected classes on a state and a federal level. And years ago, it was a little bit more common that you might see a buyer would write what people refer to as a love letter to the seller saying how much they love the home. And you know they could envision you know, their family, you know, raising their family here and this and that. But nine times out of 10, something written in those letters violated a protected class. So as realtors, we actually received guidance from New York State back in 2017 saying, because there's such a risk, oh, did that go that way? There's such a risk of um, you know, and liability associated with you know fair housing and, and violating someone's you know rights that you know realtors really should not be submitting cover letters, buyers should not be writing them. Um, so I always like to put that out there because at the end of the day, your agent should really be looking out for your best interest. And the only conversations they should have with the listing agent is really focused around the terms of the contract and the negotiations. So what goes into, you know, the actual offer paperwork and how are we doing on time here? Okay, we're good. Um, so there's so much more to it than just the price. So a lot of people will say, okay, well, you know, this home's going to sell for X, Y, Z, but it's, I very frequently will see a home might receive, you know, 20 offers, but the seller might not take the highest price offer because they're looking at all of these other terms as well. And again, like I mentioned early in the, in the presentation, sellers want a contract that's going to be the least amount of risk. Um, so the most assurance that they're going to get to the closing table and get their proceeds. So when it comes to price, there's two ways that we often see buyers will make an offer. They'll either say, hey, here's my offer price in XYZ and, and that's that, or they'll incorporate what's referred to as an escalation clause. Now, an escalation clause basically says, hey, here's my offer price. However, if a higher offer comes in, then my offer, I'm willing to pay X, Y, Z over that higher offer up to some max cap, okay? So you wouldn't risk paying over that max amount that you set for yourself. Now, um, I always disclose to buyers that does put all your cards on the table. It shows what you're willing to go up to. However, you know, the escalation clause, the way it's written, it does require proof of the competing offer um, to justify, you know, any increase in your price. Um, and you should also be very comfortable with whatever that max escalation is, you should be, you know, ready to pay that max price. Um, because it's very common that we'll see, again, in, in the presence of 20 something offers, like I said before, you know, a lot of them are probably going to have escalation clauses that escalate one another, um, and they get to some certain point. But again, you know, there are other terms that are typically involved in the contract that could appeal a little bit more than just price to the seller. So seller concessions, um, we don't see very much of this right now, but seller concessions are when a buyer asks the seller to pay a portion of their closing costs. And there's a number of reasons that a buyer might do that. Um, maybe they pre-approve great, but they just don't have like much saved up to buy a house, but they could, you know, in theory, buy a house if they had more money they might ask the seller to kind of give them some concessions. Um, that way they get that immediate you know, need for cash, um, save, cash savings out of pocket. The seller might look for a higher price to make up for that um, because they're gonna look at their net sales price. Or a buyer might say, you know what? This house is really dated. Um, I don't wanna spend all this money out of pocket to close and then have to spend another $10,000 for renovations. So maybe we'll ask the seller for a concession so we can save some money at closing. So again, you know, we don't see it very often right now, but it is something that you know we'll always go over. Um, the earnest money deposit, I mentioned that before. That's something where, while it's not usually the determining factor for why a seller is gonna select an offer, it certainly can be very appealing when they see a 
$25,000 deposit, you know, from a buyer compared to a thousand dollar deposit. The $25,000 deposit buyer has a lot more at stake than that one that only has a thousand bucks. You know, they might you know pull out the contract and only lose a thousand bucks. Whereas this person isn't going to risk $25,000. Conveyances are all your personal property that are included with the sale. So these are things like your kitchen appliances, your washer and dryer, um, anything else that might be staying on the in the home that's not physically attached to it. Um, also, too, you know, one of those things that we'll often ask the listing agent are, is: Are there any items that are excluded that the seller wants to take with them that are attached to the home? So. I, I've seen before, uh, maybe there's um, a, a very um, sentimental like chandelier that, you know, is in the house that the seller says, you know, we're going to take the chandelier, they'll replace it with something else or cap it off. Um, so things like that, you know, can come up. Um, contingencies. So contingencies are the things that need to happen within a contract in order for the buyer to close. So a couple of the key contingencies that you'll see are attorney approval. So like I said, we're an attorney state. So you're going to have a real estate attorney that's going to look at the contract, give their approval of it within the first couple of days of your accepted offer. And then once we have approval from both the buyer attorney and seller attorney, it's a little bit more solid that it's moving forward. Financing is a contingency. So if you say you, I, you have to get a mortgage in order to buy this house, that's part of the contract and you have to satisfy that contingency. Uh, inspections. So if, if part of your contract is saying, hey, we want to include an, an inspection contingency that basically states that, you know, the buyer has the right to perform a home inspection and determine, you know, if it meets their, their needs and requirements. Grants. Grants are also an additional contingency that if you are relying on obtaining them um, for some savings out of pocket at closing, that you have to include within the contract. Lots of other terms and contingencies too. <laughs> Closing date is certainly something that a seller wants to consider um, along with actual possession of the property. So the closing date, most commonly when you go and close, you'll get the keys at closing and can go right to the house. However, there's gonna be certain situations where the seller might say, we're trying to line up our sale with our purchase. Um, we we wanna close on this date, but we can't move out until a week later because we need to close on our other home and get everything moved in. In which case you might say, hey, we can certainly you know, provide that possession uh, for the seller to stay there or rent back for uh, several days or whatever the negotiated time frame is. Permits and certificates of compliance. So anytime you have like a structure on the property, fence, shed, deck, pool, um, in theory, you should be going to the town and obtaining the proper permits and certificates to show that it's built to code. Um, so that's something too that is written into the contract that your agent will discuss with you. Additional things, um, there's home warranty policies that you can request. Um, it's not standard. It's usually like a third party company that you know can, can provide them. Um, seller incentives. I've, I've had um, buyers in the past offer to pay the seller's moving costs, like offer them a $500 like gift card towards their, their moving expenses. Um, agent commission. So it is very common that the seller will compensate both agents in the transaction. So one of the nice things as a first time home buyer is that you typically are not worrying about paying your agent a commission. However, you know, I've seen a handful of times the buyer say, you know what, financially, I could afford to do it. Why don't I cover a portion um, or all of the my buyer's agent commission? to save the seller that expense on their closing costs. So again, creative things that, you know, I've seen buyers do over the past few years. And last, when it comes to your financing and the bank doing the appraisal on the home, if the, if the home doesn't appraise for whatever the purchase price is, there's a gap between the purchase price and the appraised value. And somewhere, somehow that, that gap needs to get made up. And so we've seen a lot of buyers um, that are eager to get a home might say, hey, you know what, if there is a gap, we as the buyer can cover up to a certain percentage or a portion of that. Um, again, things that we kind of dive a little bit deeper um, into when we sit down to actually review purchase contracts and offers. So in making an offer, you know, those are all the main terms and contingencies. There certainly could be other things that come up. Um, it's very situational, uh, depending on the house, the buyer, the seller. But when you make an offer, there's three possible responses, right? So either the seller is going to say, hey, we accept your offer as, as it's written. You, they just could reject your offer, uh, which when there's 20 something offers on the table, only one's getting accepted. 
the other 19 are going to get rejected. Um, or third, the seller might counter offer your offer, meaning they want to work with the buyer's offer. However, there's certain changes that they want to make. Um, maybe it's the closing date or time frame. Um, you know, maybe they say, um, you know what, we're, we're open to leaving the kitchen appliances, but you know, we've got to take the washer and dryer with us. Um, so, you know, certainly, you know, when it comes to all these delayed negotiations and multiple offer situations, it is very common that buyers have to kind of put their best foot forward because they usually only get one shot. Um, when a seller sits down to review 20 offers, they're not going back to every buyer. They're usually looking at the top two or three offers, comparing them, maybe going back to those top two or three, or they might just look at the top one and say, you know what, this is the best one out of a bunch. We're just going to accept this one. But it, it really kind of depends on how the listing agent and seller decide they want to, to handle it. There's no one size fits all. Um, include your loan officer. So this is something that not a lot of agents do, but you know, if you reach out to your loan officer and let them know, hey, I'm submitting an offer on a property, that loan officer very well might reach out to the listing agent as well and advocate on your behalf and say, hey, you know, just wanted to give you a quick call, introduce myself, let you know the buyer. I've pre-approved them. I check credit. You know, they're they're good to go. Like they they can they're they're a great buyer. Um, but also knowing when to walk away. So one of the questions that did come in, um, you know, related to what to do around a bidding war. Um, like I said, I always tell my clients to understand you definitely want to put your best foot forward. But to the same degree, you need to know what you're comfortable doing. You know, don't do something that you're going to say after your offer is accepted. Oh, was this too high? Oh, you know, I take it back. <laughs> um, that, that's just, it's not going to fare well. You know, you really have to run the numbers with your loan officer before making an offer. There's not a lot of time, but loan officers are very prompt in this market. Um, run the numbers, make sure that you're comfortable with what you're offering. And that if the seller were to accept an offer that was, you know, a thousand or 2000 more that you could say, that's okay. I, I, I was at my threshold. I could not do any more. Okay. Um, but you know, the, your agent should be reviewing all the possible options with you and what could come up to really help best position your offer. So that way you feel like you gave it your best shot. Um, and sometimes people will ask me too, they're like, is it even worth making an offer on this property? Cause you know, I can usually get a sense for how high maybe it'll go. And if it's well above my client's budget, I'll just let them know, like, it's probably going to go over. Um, they're like, well, should I bother? And I, I'll tell them yes, because you never know what is going to be written in other people's offers where you might luck out. You might kind of, you know, get that, that needle in a haystack opportunity where the seller accepts your offer. So I always tell people, you know, it never is too much time for me to write an offer. I'm always happy to do it. The contract to close portion. So I'm going to start going through this a little quicker now. Because this is where it starts to get information overload. <laughs> um, you know, once you have an accepted offer, a lot happens very quickly. You're going to have that fully executed contract. You're going to have to provide that deposit that we talked about. You're going to have to talk to your attorney and get that approval, usually within the first three days. You're going to perform home inspections, usually within that first week, and also immediately apply for that mortgage. So all that's kind of happening right at the same time. You know, your agent will kind of help facilitate and help you understand what's coming up and when to do it. Um, your lender is going to submit the application. They're going to order the appraisal and issue what's called the mortgage commitment, meaning they've reviewed and approved conditionally of your application. You're going to secure your homeowner's insurance. We talked briefly about that before. Um, and the, the most time-consuming thing that we see right now is on the attorney side. While you're doing all that work with the mortgage, the, the attorneys are actually preparing all the title documents that are going to transfer ownership from the seller to you as the buyer. Now, there's a lot of variables that are that incorporate into that. And so a lot of people are like, okay, well, shouldn't they just be able to get it within a week or two? Uh, unfortunately, every house is so different. And depending on the records you know, that are kept with the house, sometimes it can take a little bit longer. So a lot of times we'll, we'll always disclose to our clients that the closing date that we have in the contract, you know, even when it's accepted, is a target date. It is not set in stone by any means. Uh, but once, once you're ready for closing, what's going to happen is the bank is going to receive that title package from the attorneys. They're going to have all your final conditions submitted, and they're going to issue what's referred to as a clear to close. That is what is needed in order for the actual closing date to get scheduled. So until the bank issues that clear to close, nothing is set in stone. Um, but at that time, again, everything will start to happen very quickly where you know the attorneys will say, okay, it's scheduled. 
your agent will do the final walkthrough with you. We'll talk about the utilities and transferring them. Um, and then at closing, um, you're just basically signing paperwork. Um, everything should be you know, resolved and there shouldn't be anything that comes up last minute at the closing table. Um, and usually you'll get the keys right there at closing. So um, it, it kind of is a lot happening right in the beginning of the process, it kind of slows down while you're waiting for the bank and the attorneys, but then it picks up like that um, as soon as everyone's ready to go. Um, one of the last things I like to point out after closing is really protecting your investment. Um, home is a huge investment, and it's so important that you pay attention to it. Um, take care of home maintenance as, as it comes up. If you notice uh, you know, there's a recent windstorm and there's some shingles missing, have some come replace the shingles. Um, one of the biggest um, hurdles that any homeowner has is the, the diversion of water away from the property. Um, you know, if gutters aren't directing the downspouts away, um, if water is, um, if the, the grading is kind of graded right pitched towards the house and water is sitting next to this, the foundation, you'll see water in the basement, you'll see the wall start to deteriorate, and it can cause a lot of issues. So taking care of all the small problems early on can save you a lot of money down the road. Um, and I always advise people um, when it comes to taxes, um, and, and you know, wealth building, you know, talk to a CPA financial advisor, make sure that you, you feel good about, you know, your investment and how you're, you know, let's say, you know, you're, you're buying a house, and it's just you and, God forbid something happens at work and you're on disability, are you going to have enough? Talk to your financial advisor about that. Make sure that you can cover your bills um, if, if something were to ever happen. Life insurance, um, things like that. Grants and incentives. So I know there's a few questions around this. Um, so I'm going to briefly kind of give a quick um, rundown. There are, there are a number of grants and incentives out there. Um, it's important to ask the loan officers about them. If they say, oh, we don't offer any then that bank does not partner with a lot of the grant agencies because um, certain ones do, certain ones don't. Um, the city of Rochester is the most common that we'll see. They do have what's called a home purchase assistance program, which is a $3,000 grant for anyone purchasing a home within the city of Rochester. There's the employer assisted housing initiative, which is a partnership with the city of Rochester uh, and a grant of upwards of $9,000. Um, the U of R and RIT both do partner with the city of Rochester as well um, for that grant um, and incentive. The Home Buyer Dream Program, this is um, one of the, the highest um, you know, a grant amount programs where you can get upwards of like $10,000 towards your closing cost. Now, I know one of the questions that came in was, you know, every time I go to do the home buyer dream program, the money's gone. So what happened years ago is the state provides funding to banks, a certain amount of funding. And years ago, the banks used to say, hey, okay, who wants to sign up for this? Um, so people would sign up and they have to enroll for a period of at least 10 months. They'd have to make contributions into a bank account each month to get the, the grant at the very end of the program. So much of that money from the grant program from the state was going unused that they changed their program a few years ago to basically say, okay, you know what? Eliminate the time frame. You know, if a buyer is eligible, they can just get it right away. However, there's only so much funding that gets rolled out each year to the banks. Certain banks get more than others because of the amount of usage that they have with the grants. So it's important, um, you know, for individuals that are relying on the home buyer dream program program funds to make sure that they're having conversations with the loan officers around when the funds are expected to come out, how much the funds are going to be for this particular fiscal year. Um, and unfortunately, as much as like we, I, I hate telling, you know, buyers, you know, oh, that bank is out of grant funds, you're out of luck. You might have to go to another bank if you're relying on those funds, because other banks maybe that aren't quite as popular might still have funding. So it, it's it's good to make sure they've got someone that knows different resources um, and where to go um, in those situations. But, and someone had asked about why why want us, why am I getting this bias against, uh, against me because I'm a first time home buyer and utilizing these grants. And it's not that, you know, a seller's like, well, you know, you're a first time home buyer, I don't want to work with you. It's the fact that there's, it's a contingency in the contract. Um, specifically, more so I see with the city grants because they require, in addition to just saying this contract's contingent upon the buyer getting a grant, it's also typically contingent upon the city 
doing an inspection of the property themselves. And again, a seller wants to avoid and eliminate any risk associated with having to do extra work. And they just want to make sure that it just closes in the quickest and easiest fashion possible. So, you know, in a nutshell, that's kind of the gist of why sometimes it's a little tougher to get those grants. Um, unfortunately, the best position I see a buyer can be in is to qualify for the grants, but not necessarily need the grants. So if they don't need to have it, they can write up the contract, you know, just without the grants. However, once they get an accepted offer, if the funding is there, they can apply for it on the back end and still incorporate it into the closing. However, the seller no longer has to worry about the buyer having to get that grant, but the buyer is able to. That's I've seen that a, few, a handful of times as well. Um, not many agents are aware, but our New York State Association of Realtors offers a um, scholarship and um, grants as well to buyers. Um, and then also Monroe County has grants. So there's a number of different you know grants and incentives out there. A lot of them are income-based um, and there's certain eligibility requirements. However, again, there's certain lenders out in our community that can help direct you to the ones that are going to be best fitted for you. So um, almost done here. All right, so next steps. So if it is something where you're interested in purchasing a home, I first and foremost, start looking at the financing. Reach out to a lender, get pre-approved, uh, start understanding the numbers and how they're going to work for you and what you're comfortable with. Um, second, or you can even do this before you start pursuing the financing is meet with a realtor. Um, a lot of the stuff that I covered in this, in this presentation, as far as the financing goes, are things that I'm urging my buyers when I first meet with them to talk to their lenders about. Um, and really making sure that the lenders are aware to, hey, talk to the buyer about these things. And then, you know, kind of starting your home search, starting to look at homes. Um, and certainly for anyone who is taking advantage of getting as much information as possible, but maybe knows they're not going to buy here. Um, you know, we have a lot of resources across the country um, between our, our network and everything where you can always reach out and ask if, if we know someone in a certain place. But all right. So whew, how am I on time? 706, a little over seven. Um, so Victor, do we have any questions or? Oh, and I'm sorry, real quick too. So the QR code that I have um, on the screen here, um, everyone here in person will have that in their packet. And that will, if, if you're on Zoom and you scan the QR code, you'll be able to go on and download our um, all the resources that you know we've provided. So you'll get a copy of this presentation that we just went through um, along with, you know we have you know 30 something page buyer guide there that kind of really breaks down everything as well and some additional resources too. So I'm sorry, Victor, go ahead. Uh, we have three real quick. Sure. Um, how long will a pre-approved offer from a bank be valid for? And what if we aren't able to find a home before the offer from the bank expires? Yep. So that's a good question. So um, pre-approvals are good for usually 60 to 90 days. As long as nothing changes for you as a buyer financially, it's just a matter of reaching back out to the bank and saying, hey, um, you know, I got pre-approved three months ago, but it's expired. And they'll probably just rerun your credit, make sure that hasn't, they'll verify with you, nothing else has changed, and then reissue a new pre-approval letter. Perfect. Um, are home inspections possible only after we have made an offer and the seller has accepted it? So there's... So I've seen some inspectors will do a quote unquote 30 minute showing inspection where on a home showing, they'll come with the buyer. Um, the buyer still has to pay for that, um, which can get costly because you never know if your offer is actually going to get accepted or not. Um, but you need permission from the seller and the listing agent to have an inspector go through with you. And that's where, you know, we saw it closer to the start of the shutdown and the pan and shortly after everything started opening up. Um, we don't see it quite as much nowadays. But, you know, it's something where, unfortunately, I would say about 85 to 90% 90 of the offers accepted right now are waiving inspections. So it, it is still a market where we're seeing the majority are waiving. Um, I always tell buyers, as we go through contract terms, I present the options and I let them decide what they're comfortable with. I think it's in every buyer's best interest to do a home inspection. I, I really do. Unfortunately, the market of buyers has determined that, hey, we can be more competitive if we wave, a, wave an inspection. Um, so you might see some homes where you're like, yeah, not a chance that I'm going to wave an inspection on this. After seeing a certain number, you might say, you know what, this home, certainly a different quality home than some of these other ones. So ultimately, we always leave up to our buyer. We ask them, like, what's your comfort level with this? Um, and 
any buyer that waives a home inspection, you know, after, you know, on the contract, I always advise them after closing, you can't do anything after closing if there's something wrong, but to do a home inspection after closing for your knowledge and to know if there is anything to keep in mind or budget for, because, you know, a home inspector is there to kind of help elim some help reduce some of your risk as a home buyer. So good question. I have one more on here. If I'm still saving for a home, how early should I get in contact with a real estate agent? A few months, a year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, so I, I take a very educational approach to um, the, the home buying and selling process. Uh, that's why I enjoy doing these, these workshops. So I always tell buyers and sellers, I'm happy to meet with you years in advance. Um, I've had some buyers that, you know, they took, you know, a year or two to really be ready to buy a home. And that's perfectly fine. At the end of the day, it's not about me determining when someone's ready to buy. It's the process is around them. Um, so I'm a firm believer that the earlier you can sit down and talk to someone, um, also a loan officer, sitting down and talking to them to understand the finances, um, it's going to help you understand that best plan to save and get to where you want to be when you want to purchase a house. So there, there's no wrong time frame as as early as someone wants to start um sitting down it's it's you know any agent should sit down with you no charge you know any agent that charged you let, let me know it should be a free complimentary you know consultations um but yeah it's definitely something as early a, a, in advance as possible if anybody here has any questions let me know Uh, my friend bought a house recently and she kind of described the difference between a bank versus a credit union. And I don't understand. She said credit unions were better for mortgages. Could you explain a bit about that difference or anything? I tend to lean towards very much so personal preference. Um, and again, this is where shopping around will come into play. Um, some might argue like, you know, the rates might be slightly different um, from one or fees might be different from one to the next. But again, you know, I always encourage people to check with two to three lenders, um, have one of them be a credit union, have one of them be like a, a, a mortgage banker, a mortgage broker that might, you know, kind of sell the, the loan afterwards to the secondary mortgage market market that's very common. Um, but at the end of the day, shop around those couple of different places um, to make sure that it's the right fit for you. You know, as important as it is to, you know, focus on the finances and everything, You'll also find that sometimes the individual you're working with at that particular bank can make or break the process for you. So uh, that's where a lot of times we'll recommend certain individuals specifically because we know how they work and operate and how they communicate with the client and help educate them as well. So the client can really make sure that they are happy with the process and the product that they're getting from the bank, whether it's a credit union, you know, an actual bank. So. Question. Um, so if we're like maybe like a year out from buying a home, does it make more sense to go to a loan officer and get that budget or go to a realtor first and like start talking about it? Either or. Um, okay. I think it's good to sit down with both, uh, mainly because your realtor is going to be able to kind of walk you through the process a little bit, help you understand, you know, what the market conditions are currently doing, and maybe what they'll look like in that estimated time frame. Um, you know, I don't in this presentation kind of go into the, like in depth in like each month, you know, what to expect and, you know, best times of the year is to list or buy. Um, but, you know, they can certainly really walk you through, okay, uh, what, what are your goals as far as like, you know, are you trying to line it up with a lease or, you know, what's your flexibility? And then the loan officer getting pre-approved today, even though it's not going to be valid in a year, will help you understand the numbers and in them looking at your credit, you know, I, most of my buyers are pretty on top of understanding their credit, but every once in a while, there's something that pops up and the loan officer might say, Hey, you know what, this, this happened to show up in your credit report. Um, you know, this is something that you might want to focus on between now and a year out. Um, sometimes it's things we don't even realize are on there that might be, you know, kind of reducing our score, but they can really kind of give you that roadmap to make sure, okay, if this is kind of like your goal, like financially, here's where you want your credit score to be pay off this loan first, you know, take care of this. So, okay. um, it, it is a good idea to sit down with a, a realtor and a, a lender, you know, as early in advance. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
can your agent help you find a home inspector or is this something that you have to do on your own to do your own research to, to find a home inspector to hire or? Yeah, so it's pretty typical that most people will use an agent um, because for buyers, there's no charge. And so most buyers are gonna have someone um, when you reach out directly to a listing agent, if you come across a property yourself and you don't have an agent, that agent is still getting, they're just getting double the commission now. Um, and their primary goal as a listing agent is to sell that house, not find you the right house. And so a lot of times when you're working with an agent, like when someone starts working with us, we sit down, try to really understand what your needs and wants are. And then we'll start monitoring. So you'll get the search, you'll get home sent directly to you. But once we start to, show you homes and understand what stands out, what appeals to you, we're able to start really narrowing down and say, hey, we didn't hear from you on this particular home. We think this might be a good match for you. And so we'll kind of really start, you know, providing recommendations for you to start looking at because we, we monitor, you know, all the homes that come onto the market day in and day out. Um, so it's very common that, you know, the agent, a good agent should be working with you to kind of help you find that right house. And they'll be sending you things for you to look at. And at the end of the day, you might get a lot of property listings. And again, you're going to have to go through and kind of filter out which ones are right for you or which ones might not be. So, cool. And there's another question online. What about a buyer and a seller meeting privately and making a sale without any realtors or attorneys involved? Can a seller and buyer complete a transaction without anyone else involved? Yep. So that would be a private transaction. So, and again, the only reason we don't see this very much right now, it's not, it's not like it, it can't happen, but we don't see it very commonly just because a seller in this market with the volume of buyers that are available a seller's usually it's to their advantage to list a property for sale. But that being said, you know, we've seen situations with our own buyers. You know, I always advocate for my buyers to do what's right for them. And they might happen to talk to, you know, an aunt and someone passed away and they're like, hey, can we buy the house? Um, and they end up doing a private transaction uh, with no agents involved. And that's perfectly fine. It's just those opportunities are very far and few in between um, where we, we don't see them come up very often, but it is possible for a buyer and a seller to do it privately just kind of through their attorneys because they definitely want to make sure that they're, they each still have separate legal representation. And then speaking of buying, several people tell me to wait and now is not a good time to buy. What are your thoughts? So Again, when it comes to deciding to buy, you know, I, I kind of go over that in the beginning as far as like, it really is a personal decision. But as far as my personal opinion, you, you're you not going to start building equity for yourself um, and, and owning something until you actually take that leap uh, and purchase a home. Otherwise, you're just going to keep throwing your money away. Even with interest rates having risen, you know, into, you know, the sixes, you know, it's still, you're still building equity for yourself. And the way the market is right now, homes are still appreciating. So I think it's worth it, you know, certainly, but again, it, it's a, it's very much a personal decision um, and something that we can kind of help people navigate based on their specific situation. Awesome. All right. Well, I certainly appreciate everyone joining in person on Zoom. Um, this is actually the first in-person workshop that I've done. I've done everything up to now has been via Zoom. So I appreciate you, you all joining me today. Um, and yeah, if there's any other questions, feel free to check out the QR code to download some resources. My information is on here, as well as um, when you download everything, um, you'll have access to my information. I'm sure Victor will send an email out as well. So thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. That was a lot of information. <laughs> I, I did this last year. We did this last year and I'm still like, okay. <laughs> still not there, but a little closer for me now. Um, thank you again, everybody, for, for those who are in person, for those who are online. Um, just a little bit of the housekeeping at the end. Things we always have to do. Um, if you're not following us on Facebook, Instagram, all the social media channels, definitely um, start following us on there. We share all of our events that are happening in your area um, on there. If you are, 
Perfect. There is a new RIT only platform. If you have not heard about it, uh, for those of you here, it's on your water bottle, actually. Um, it's Tigers Connect, um, again, which is the RIT only platform it allows you to connect with other alums and it allows our students to, to connect with our alumni as well. Um, that just started last year and it's in full force. We have over 3,000, 4,000 users online already. Um, and it's awesome. I always find it really cool when I have a student reach out and be like, I have a question about graphic design because that was my field when I was here and I'm obviously not doing that now. <laughs> um, other than that, you could just go online and check out any of our events that we have. We have them here in Rochester. We have them all over the country um, and we're getting back into the larger gatherings and, and bigger events. So be on the lookout for those again, on all of our social media channels, as well as online. Um, and just make sure if you want more emails about anything going on, your contact information is updated with us. Um, that includes your address and email and mailing address so that you get the right information <laughs> when we send that out. Um, again, thank you everyone for being here. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, enjoy the rest of your week and weekend because it's Friday, Junior. Um, and yeah, have a good night.